Good morning, dear friends. Welcome to our broadcast this morning. I am would like to uh, first, as always, just make sure that people who are there can hear me, can see me well, and that everything is working out. So if you are arriving and listening and could just put a little word for me and let me know that you can hear me, that would be great. All right, Giselle, good morning. Good to see you. I'm assuming you can hear me well, right? And see me and everything is okay. I'm alone in the studio today, so I just wanna make sure that I get some feedback from you guys. Awesome. All right, thank you so much. So we are going to start our meeting today. Again, I wanna welcome everyone. As always, we're gonna do our, thank you, Lucia, good morning. As always, I want to do uh, our reading today is going to be from the book Living Spring, and I'm opening here right now with you guys. Uh, lesson 129 Be patient. You need patience so that after you have done God's will, you may receive the promise. Paul, in letter to Hebrews 10 36. You have probably been holding on to tormented hope for a long time. You would like the world's answer to your longings to appear immediately, enfolding your heart. However, what kind of peace could you enjoy in the apparent triumph of your dreams if you have not redeemed the debts that chain you to problems and difficulties? How can you have a moment's rest when your creditor is demanding payment? Could a criminal find rest in light of the due reparation for the crime he or she has committed? You know that destiny will materialize your plans for happiness. That victory will finally crown your pathway of struggle. But you find yourself bound to the circle of certain obligations. Your home, which has become a forge of anguish. Your workplace, where you suffer slander or cruelty. The family member to whom you owe respect and love, but from whom you receive scorn and ingratitude. The web of obstacles. The conspiracy of darkness. Needless persecution. The infirmity of the body. The impositions of your environment. If trials have imprisoned you behind the restraining bars of a duty you have to fulfill, be patient and satisfy the obligations you have embraced. Do not renounce your renewing endeavor. Remember that God's will is expressed each hour in the circumstances that surround us. Let us pay our debts to the darkness so that the light may bless us. Yes, we will accomplish the materialization of our plans for happiness, but before that, we must patiently liquidate the debts we have contracted before the law. Wow, <laughs> that is a great message. Um, again, that was message 129 from the book, Living Spring. It's interesting because the title is Be Patient and tied up with uh, the topic of happiness, which is the topic of our um, lecture today. So, very nice. We will um, do our initial prayer and get started with our lecture for today. Good morning, JC. Thank you for the feedback. So if you would, please join me in our opening prayer by saying, Dear Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to be here today in this beautiful Sunday to pray, to meditate, to nourish our souls with the teachings of the gospel and the spiritual doctrine. Bless us all, incarnates and discarnates, people who are here present with us right now, the ones who may be joining, the ones who may be listening at another time. May we all be blessed. May we all be touched by your love. Help us to stay tuned to the message of today and to move on 
after today's meeting, as always, trying to bring these teachings to our daily lives in order to experience more and more happiness each day. Thank you again for this opportunity. Bless us all and so be it. All right, dear friends, she is a good morning. All right, I am going to ask you for your one minute of your patience as I am setting myself up here. Oh no, where did it go? One second, guys. Mm. Where is my own presentation? Okay, let's see here. There it is. However, I cannot see my own slides. It was right here. Hold on, give me one second, please. Hmm. Okay, I got it. I'm piloting my own presentation today, so give me one second. I'm going to get this right in a minute. I got it now. Okay, so here we go. Let's see if I have this. Yes. Okay, so I will apologize for um the little confusion here okay so our topic for today is mastering relative happiness and i would like to start by saying that um happiness is something that we um as a as, as humanity right it's not something it's not a topic that belongs to a culture or a religion a group of people I mean, no matter who we are, no matter what our belief system is, no matter where we are in this planet, right? Um, it's a common denominator for all of us, for our humanity, which is to seek happiness. So what we are going to try to do today is to um, define first what is not happiness. And then we are going to uh, try to explore a little bit the concept of happiness. And last, we are going to um, look into how we can maximize uh, happiness in our lives. So our, our, our meditation, our lecture is divided in these um, three parts. Okay, so I would like to start by bringing some questions first that can uh, help uh, warm up our brains and so some of these questions are you know what is happiness right so if you could be talking to me i would probably ask a few of you to tell me you know what is your understanding of happiness and we probably would have uh, some um answers that were like similar we probably would have some different answers um i can also ask you for instance to think for a second if the things that make you happy today were the same things that made you happy, let's say 20 years ago. Um, it's likely that the answer is no. So is happiness a ever evolving concept? Um, so that's another thing for us to think about. Uh, also, let's say if you were given all the resources and wealth in the world, how would you manage that in order to uh, maximize your happiness? Where would you put these resources? How would you use these resources? So those are just a couple questions, a few questions that help us to get started. And I told you that the first thing that we we're going to do this morning is to make sure that we determine what happiness is not. But before we get there, I would like to bring to you a few concepts from the Spirit's book and the Gospel that will guide our um, lecture today. And you will see this uh, lecture at the end, it is a little bit of a study of the Spirit's book and how we can use like different questions from different parts to put together uh, these ideas. So 
here we go. So like I said, we're going to look at what is not happiness first, right? And we're starting with this quote from uh, the spirits that you find in question 920. When Kardec is going to ask the spirits if it's possible for us to enjoy complete happiness on this uh, planet. And the spirits are going to start by saying life on earth is given to us as trials and expiations. So right there, if we would stop and um, think about what this means, it means like the answer is no. So it's not possible for us to experience complete happiness in this planet because we are in a planet of trials and expiations, a planet where as we know, suffering is still prevails, not because God wanted to be this way, but because it corresponds to the nature of our uh, evolution, of our awareness, of where we stand in our spiritual journey. So still a place of a lot of unawareness and a place where uh, we still uh, privilege matter over things of the spirit, we have a, a poor understanding of our essence and the purpose of life. Although cognitively we can speak about it, uh, emotionally we are still very disconnected from those meanings. So therefore we're in a planet where we still make a number of mistakes and have consequences that bring pain and suffering to us because it is, it is a painful process, the process of growth. And then the spirits are going to continue by saying it depends on us to mitigate our misfortunes and be as happy as possible. So here we have uh, perhaps what I'm going to call the first tip for today's lecture, that although we are in this situation, we do have some power. We're not like powerless in the system. We do have um, the power to mitigate, the power to decrease, to diminish the level of suffering that we are experiencing. When we go to question uh, the next... Uh, I didn't get that. I'm sorry, my phone always wants to do the lecture with me and talks with me. Before we go to the next question of the Spirit's book, we have the same concept worked by the spirits in the gospel according to Spiritism. And in there, we are going to see that the Spirit says, in general terms, one can affirm the happiness is a utopia, the search for which successive generations have set out without ever being able to okay. reach it. For if a wise individual is a rarity in this world, an absolutely happy one is not easier to find. So again, I think this is important. It's important for us when we're thinking about happiness to have it clear that this idea of a uh, total happiness is childish. It is a fantasy. It is an utopia as the spirits are telling us. So first thing that we need to do is kind of set things in the right place and enter the topic with the right mindset, understanding that this complete happiness, it's really not possible at the present moment. With this in mind, we can move on to the next question, which is question 921, where Kardec is going to ask the spirits. Okay, I get it. Complete happiness is not possible. But meanwhile, is it possible for anyone to enjoy a relative happiness? And it's a long answer, but I put just the first sentence of this answer, which says, most of the time they are artisan of their own unhappiness. So tip number two, right? Number one is, yes, we have the power to mitigate our sufferings. And number two is, well, for the most part, we are building our unhappiness on, on a daily basis. The spiritists like to, like to think that um, and justify the suffering that they experience in the present moment as a result of past actions, which means I did in the past, I knew no better, I'm reaping you know, uh, the, the effects of what I did in the past. But the spirits are gonna argue differently. They tell us that 
most of the suffering, most of the <clears throat> trouble that we experience today is actually the result of our choices in the present moment. And so when we go to the gospel, we're going to learn uh, and read about the source of earthly misfortunes. The spirits are going to tell us that humans are in the majority of the cases, the artisans of their own misfortunes. Misfortunes are a natural consequence of the character and behavior of those who bear them. So again, so we, we can mitigate our suffering and we can become more conscious of in which ways are we producing our own unhappiness. This is an important step to be happy. So it ties up to our character and our behavior. So analysis and understanding of what are the characteristics of our character. There are, um, there are barriers to our happiness and looking at the quality of our behavior. Is it a behavior that is um, fostering harmony or disharmony in our lives? And what's really interesting is that this uh, passage continues on and the spirits are going to give us clear examples on how our behavior creates some happiness for ourselves. So they're going to say humans are victims of pride, imprudence and ambition. Marriages, they are the result of self-interest and vanity. Disagreements and quarrels that could be avoided with less susceptibility, infirmities and illnesses. They are the consequence of intemperance and excesses. Unhappy parents who did not combat their kids' bad inclinations. So here are just a few examples, again, of how our behavior, how our daily choices are impacting the quality of our life and our state of well-being in the happiness that we experience. If we look at these um, reasons the spirits give us, right, we see nowadays so many marriages, they're happening a little backwards, we would say, where people rush into getting married for some questionable reasons. Um, it's very nice to be attracted to someone, but we understand that that first moment where we meet someone is a lot of uh, passions, a lot of lust, and um, but that's not necessarily what love is about, right? So the natural course of things would, and it used to be this way, where we would actually date for a while, get to know people, right, a little bit before actually jumping into a marriage. So a lot of times um, we are rushing into a process and then dealing in the near future with a number of uh, problems that could be avoided. They were not necessarily meant to be there in the first place. We created with our, uh, with, the, with our voids, with our emotional needs, or with our ambition, or whatever it is that led us to that circumstance that maybe wasn't even planned to be there in our life. The same thing, um, the, the number of disagreements, of quarrels, of um, uh, little daily private wars that we nourish in our lives because of our frailty, emotional frailty, how um, easy we get hurt, how easy we feel unseen, how easy we feel not valued uh, by others because we don't first value and love ourselves to the point that we need to. So we're very vulnerable in this area and that causes a lot of problems and a lot of difficulties, especially in family life that could be avoided or more easily resolved if we were a little bit more together emotionally and spiritually. Same thing with infirmities and illnesses. Not every single illness is a result of something from the past. A lot of times we are causing the imbalances in our physical body right now with the excesses, with the disrespect for the limits without paying attention to the needs of our physical body. And again, we don't do that because we are bad. We do that because a lot of times, for example, um, food becomes a way of um, suiting our emotions, of making us feel good 
when we are unable to properly process our feelings and so forth. So again, we could go on and on on this slide about all those things. The point I'm trying to make is one important piece about our happiness is to observe our character, observe our behavior, and really, really be attentive on how much of the unhappiness that we experience has been created by us. And we spend a lot of time blaming others for that. But the fact is that people can do anything they want to us. It is the way we respond to them that will set states of more or less happiness for ourselves. All right. But perhaps another important uh, problem that we have is where we're looking or placing our happiness. Perhaps we're not doing that in the right way or putting that at the right place. So a recent survey um, with millennials uh, was done and they were asked what were they, their main goals in life. And 80% of them responded that their main goals were to be rich and another 50% was to be famous. And all of them stated that they um, were told from the moment they were born or the moment they arrived to this country that um, if they worked really, really hard, if they gave everything they had, that they would be able to enjoy um, uh, wellness and, um, and to be rich and to be happy. And so um, that the working hard has been tightly correlated to having more things and also being happy. Now, another um, interesting, really interesting uh, study that I want to uh, share with you some information about is this Harvard Longitudinal Study of Adult Development which is one of the longest uh, longitudinal studies uh, done. It started in 1938, and it's a study that was put together um, in an attempt to understand human happiness. So they researched and followed 724 young men over the course of their entire lives. Uh, the study still goes on today. There are a number of really interesting TED Talks about the study. It's been such a long study that actually even the researchers have been, um, uh, new ones have come on board in order to keep the study uh, going on. So what they did is um, they uh, track the life of these uh, 724 men year after year, asking them about their work, about their lives at home, the, the health, without, of course, having any idea of how their lives would unfold. So they followed two groups. One group were sophomore um, at Harvard, and they all finished college around the time of uh, World War II. Many of them went on to serve at the war. And the second group was a group of uh, boys from one of the poorest neighborhoods in Boston in the 1930s. And they were chosen precisely because they were they lived in some of the most trouble and disadvantaged areas of Boston at the time. So some of them even lived in communities in, in areas where there was not uh, they didn't have running water, for example. So what they did is they um all of these um young men entered the study when they were in their youth and they received medical exams they were interviewed their parents were also interviewed then they uh became adults and entered all types of walks of life some of them became bricklayers, some of them became lawyers, factory workers, um, doctors. One of them became the president of the United States. Some of them developed alcoholism. We had a few who developed uh, schizophrenia. Some of them climbed the social ladder uh, from the very bottom all the way to the top. Some of them did the opposite journey uh, from the top to the bottom. And every two years, the researchers would send questionnaires, but also go to their homes, sit down with them, 
interview them, um, they would um, get the medical records from the doctors, they draw bloods, they CT scan their brains, they talk to the children, they videotape these men uh, in their uh, homes talking with their wives about uh, some of their more uh, most concerning topics. So you can see the extent and the in-depth of this uh, research. So what did they learn from the 10,000 pages of information that they gather about the lives of these men that from the get-go came from such opposite, if you will, um, backgrounds, right? So one lesson was very, very clear, which is what happiness was not about. And happiness was not about wealth or fame and much less about working super hard. So none of these primary goals of our millennials were the ones who actually were tied up to happiness, no matter who these men were and from which group they were. Interestingly, this is uh, what uh, we also see uh, with Kardec. So on question 926 of the Spirit's book, we learned that the wealthiest on earth is the one with fewer needs, a sentence that is always in my mind and like, like a little bug bothering me um, in the sense of like making me really think about it, what are my needs, right? But then this is another really um, powerful statement that says neither wealth, power, nor even the flower of youth are the essential conditions for happiness. I would say more, not even the combining of these three much desired conditions are capable of producing happiness. So I think it's pretty clear for us right now. I hope it is for you as it is for me. The happiness, it's not exterior. It's not on the material. It can't be on things that we have one day and another day we may or may not have things that are not going to go with us. And I'm not arguing that having money brings a level of comfort to life. But uh, we know for a fact of many people who have tons and tons of money and not necessarily happier than I am, for instance, or maybe you are. And also we know of people who have much less than I and you have and they experience greater levels of happiness than I and you do. So what is happiness truly, truly about? I want to close this first part with this uh, little story about um, Socrates, where he was walking through the streets of Athens looking, and, and he, he passed by um, um, a street uh, market, and so he's, he's looking at the things that are on sale and a merchant uh, approached him and said, sir, what do you wish to buy? And his answer is another bug in my head up these days since I heard this story because he says, I'm only observing how many things are there that I do not need to be happy, which is the opposite that I don't know about you, but I usually am looking, what do I need? What do I need? Right. What do I need to buy? What do I need to have? And here he's looking at things and saying, I'm looking at all these things that I'm seeing here that I don't need to be happy. What a challenge and what a great exercise for us to do. Very well. So let's talk about possible happiness then. Um, and to do that, I want to start by defining happiness a little bit. Um, and the reason why you see that butterfly over there is because um, we're going to be talking about a type of happiness that is not a butterfly moment. And what is a butterfly moment? A butterfly moment is that moment that the butterfly lands on your hand and you're like, wow, when you're looking at the butterfly and you, you, you're you starting to admire it. And next thing you know, boom, it's gone. So this is the happiness that usually we experience. It's very fleeting. It comes with the things that we have, with the things that we acquire, and it lasts maybe a couple hours, a day, two, maybe. And then we are, we are out in about to our next purchase, to the next thing that's going to bring us happiness. 
because that type of happiness does not stick with us and does not fulfill us from within. So that's not really what we're going to be talking about. And there's this book that I really like very much called The Upside of Your Dark Side, which I have cited in a few of my lectures. And in this book, the psychologists who wrote the book, they propose happiness not as a goal to be pursued, but the outcome of something bigger, the effect of something like wholeness, integration, and connection. So here, the proposal is, well, maybe happiness should, shouldn't be something that we are pursuing per se, shouldn't be our primary goal in life, but perhaps the outcome of something else, something else that they're going to call wholeness, they call integration and connection. I would like for you to keep those words in the back of your mind. So especially the word integration and connection, because we will be talking about that um, a little later on. Very good. So um, in the introduction of this book, right? So one idea that they bring is that happiness is not empty of stress or conflict, which is something first to also think about. But it's seen in persons who develop the ability to deal with what is the equivalent of camping. All right, what is that? What is the equivalent of camping, right? So what happens when you camp? When you camp, you don't have, I mean, real camping, folks. I'm not talking about fancy camping. I'm talking real camping. Real camping, you don't have a shower with hot water. Real camping, you don't have good walls to protect you from the environment. Uh, camping, you don't have a toilet that can flush things down, right? So this is um, what he's uh, referring to. Happiness is seeing persons who develop the ability to deal with emotional equivalent of camping. So that means people who can handle distress, who can face adversities and do not shy away from the feelings that come naturally with dealing with these distresses, with these challenges, might be anger, might be guilt, might be sadness, might be loss, whatever that might be. Instead of shying away from those feelings, they are actually able to draw from these feelings something good, some learning, right? So one question that I would ask myself is, you know, when I'm thinking of happiness, okay, why would I want to camp? Why would I want to go through the distresses of camping if I can stay in a nice hotel? <laughs> and I could have very well put my face with those question marks because that would be me, right? So it would be nice uh, if I can afford to be in, you know, I love the wild as long as I can go back to a good bed and a hot shower and um, I confess, I have never camped in my life. I have no desire whatsoever, not even fancy camps is something that I wish to do. But they go on and they explain that um, this camping experience is equivalent to, it develops this um, sentiment or, or experience called distress tolerance. So it makes you, the distress tolerance makes you a better camper. And it allows you to become stronger, wiser, mentally agile, and most important, happy in a resilient way. So this is something that I really want you guys to think about. Um, happiness is not absence of troubles, of difficulties, of problems. Happiness is seen in people who are like campers. They can face the adversities. They can face the limitations. And they can learn and grow from that. And um, the, the, the disposition to, to go camping, in other words, to embrace the difficulty and the limitations, make us um, more resilient, make us more prepared to take life and to be happy. Interesting is that this concept is also um, brought uh, to us in these, uh, the Book of Joy, written by the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. In this statement is really outstanding, where they are going to say that joy is the inexperience of being able to be content. 
it is a permanent trait, a way of being that does not eliminate the frustrations of life, that does not avoid painful tears, but allow us to cry more easily and to smile more easily as well. We are talking about the inner joy that makes us more alive each day. It is the joy that makes us go through suffering in a way that enriches us instead of destroying us. I cannot tell you how much I love this uh, statement and how it really reshapes the idea of joy, of happiness to a much deeper, a much more permanent uh, state as opposed to this crazy search for happiness in the wrong places as we have uh, talked about. So again, being a little bit more mature about how we approach happiness, it's not a Hollywood type of happiness. It is a day-to-day -day happiness, something that stays within. It does not ask for life to be any different, but it embraces life, right? And it, it takes what life gives you and does not let that crush you, but actually strengthens you. And you can laugh more easily and you can also cry more easily. I think that's really an amazing idea for us to think about. Also, uh, you know, in, in defining happiness, right? So researchers, um, they have associated a number of feelings to uh, to happiness, and it's it's kind of similar to love. So you can feel like contentment, like you can be content about something. You can be very excited about something, a new opportunity, or something, uh, a new baby that's on the way. I mean, wedding down, you know, uh, engagement. I mean, so exciting, exciting things. You can also be happy from relief. So let's say you're waiting for the result of um, a diagnostic testing and you get the result and, you know, it's it's just negative. Wow, relief, joy, tears of joy, right? Contentment. So that's also another experience of joy, very uh, specific. You can be in wonder. You can be um, ex exulting because you accomplished something that was very very difficulty difficult and and you did it you can be in a state of bliss so many many different feelings associated to happiness but those three called gratitude and the ability to rejoice and what they call spiritual radiance are the ones that have been tied up to this type of happiness that we are talking about something more enduring lasting resilient um permanent if you will um that we experience so let's um see what they are about so gratitude embraces all circumstances of life it's your relation to life so people who are grateful and joanna jones just has an entire book on gratitude where she clearly speaks that gr about gratitude not, not as that feeling of you receive something and you're thankful for whatever someone is giving you but a more permanent state of being grateful to everything. So it's your relationship to life. It's your relationship to God. It's, it comes from the deeper understanding of the meaning of life and just being able to truly, truly embrace life as it is, understanding that the universe and God is always, always conspiring for our happiness. So it's that type of relationship that is so closely related to, to happiness, actually. The ability to rejoice of self and others is to be, be able to relate to someone else's happiness just as your own. So to truly, truly be happy with the accomplishment of others. When we understand that our role is to help everyone to succeed, we kind of hold hands and let's all run together and and cross the finish line together and be happy together, you should have just as much as I have, right? So the ability to rejoice with humanity is accomplished without feeling threatened, without feeling diminished. That is, my dear friends, an incredible source of uh, joy in our lives. The spiritual radiance, serene joy born from deep well-being and benevolence. So benevolence, when we take the idea that life is service, and I don't mean material charity only. I mean 
being at service is an inner state to be at service at all times, paying attention to others, giving, giving your time, giving your resources, giving your heart, giving your ears, giving your shoulders, giving your hands, giving. Because the more we give, the more we have. The more we give, the more we find out that we have. So those three sentiments are deeply, deeply related and tying with a more lasting um, experience of happiness. And what do they have in common? What is the common denominator across them? They're all relational, right? Relation with others, relations with self, and the relation with God as well. Now, interestingly, going back to the research, um, the Harvard Longitudinal uh, Study is, I did tell you what they define not to be happiness. What I did not tell you is what they found to be happiness. And let's look at that right now. So the defining component of happiness was good relationships keep us happier and healthier. The man who turned out to be the happiest, regardless of their background and social economical status, were the ones who were more skilled to relate and to value relationships. So that really uh, should make us stop and think a little bit about this in the sense of like, bam, okay, relationships. How are my relationships? How is the quality of my relationships? How healthy my relationships are nowadays? How much do I value relationships? How much do I value that I am in a society? How much am I investing into relating, into bringing people into my life, into nourishing uh, meaningful relationships? They go on by saying social connection bring happiness. And it's not about the number of connections you have in life, but the quality of the connections. Secure attachment to others, which is knowing that you can count on people, not only affects your physical health, but also your brain health. So relationships not only bring happiness, but also well-being, physical well-being, literally. Of course, we are not talking about uh, social media relationships. I have 2,000 friends, 1,000 followers, whatever you call them. Um, this is not what this is about. We are talking about real connections, intimate connections. And it doesn't need to be that very, very close friend of yours that you talk every day. But do you have a number of people who are meaningful in your life? You know, um, there are all kinds of friendships. There's a number of people, for example, in the spiritual movement that I don't talk to them every day. Maybe we meet in some conferences. I consider them my friends. Um, we have walking off together. I know that if I ever need them, they will be there for me. Um, their, our relationship, although may not be so close, it's something that nourishes me, that adds to who I am and that contributes to who I am today. So, you know, so it, it, it's, it's a realm, right? But certainly not, we're not talking about um, relationships in social media. We're talking about real relationships. Um, very good. So we get to our very last leg here, which is maximizing happiness. Now that we know what is not, what happiness is not, what happiness is, we talk about happiness being this um, uh, more resilient and more fulfilling type of happiness. We are not really talking about butterfly happiness moments. That's what we are after. So how can we maximize that? <clears throat> okay, let's go back to question 121. And we already read this first part of the sentence. So we go into the second part in black. If they, which is us, if we would practice the law of God, they would spare themselves many misfortunes and enjoy happiness as great as their existence on such dense planet plane will allow. Okay, so here is the key, the key for our happiness. And we're going to spend our last 15, 10 minutes here to understand this, okay? 
So the key for happiness is the practice of God's law. So at this point, you should be saying, man, what do I know about God's laws, right? Am I practicing it? How can I practice more? Because if that is the key, is something that we should be curious about and we should be really studying about so we can understand to maximize our happiness here on earth. So in question 614, the spirits are going to say that the natural law is the law of God. It is the only true law, the only, only true law necessary for happiness of human beings. It shows what they should or should not do, and they only suffer misfortune because they reject it. So we only experience suffering and pain because we're rejecting, because we're turning away, because we are resisting, or we are not uh, following this law, the only true necessary for human happiness. So we need to understand a little bit more about the law. So in question 617, we learned that all the laws of nature are divine. So divine laws, natural laws, same thing. Because God is the author of all things. Scientists study the laws of matter, whereas more individuals study and follow those of the soul. So the divine law or the natural law can be um, divided into broad categories. The material one, where science is studied, the laws of matter, and the laws uh, of the soul that are studied by people like you and me, uh, people who are interested in, in, in morality, in ethics, in the education of uh, the soul. So to further understand that, uh, we need to understand that the laws themselves are one. Uh, the, the laws are the same, okay? Uh, among the divine laws, some regulate movement in relations to base matter. They are the physical laws, and studying them belong to the domain of science. Others specifically concern humans and their relationship with God, their fellow beings, encompassing rules of the life of the body and those of the soul. These are the moral laws. Bingo, right? So here, the divine laws, they regulate our relationships with God and our fellow human beings. We learn through science that the key for happiness is relating. Following God's laws improves what exactly on the moral stand improve our relationships. So these, my dear friends, is the key for this whole talk of today. So the divine laws they are concerned with our relationship. And this is why we need each other to evolve. This is why no one is going to become an enlightened spirit, praying 24 hours indoors or in the top of a mountain. There is no true evolution without one another, without loving one another. So if you want to be happy, the key for happiness is to invest in our relationships. How? By practicing God's laws in our relating with ourselves, with our neighbors, and with God. And for that, we have Jesus as our model. So Jesus is our standard model, guide for the practice of the law. He is the highest standard of moral perfection. In his doctrine, his life is the pure expression of this law. He is the purest being that has ever walked on earth. So Jesus is the purest expression of God's law. So he should be the reference, meaning we should be thinking and asking ourselves, what is it that Jesus would do or how did Jesus treat others? And just briefly, we never saw Jesus putting anyone down. We never saw Jesus um, diminishing people. Uh, criticizing people for no reason, gossiping, um, uh, rejecting, pushing away, walking away, giving up on people, none of that, right? So what? how did he relate with us? Without judgment, with profound respect, and always in an uplifting and dignifying way.
So this can be just a starting point for us to think about what he represents as a model for our happiness and how we are doing, okay? Not to feel bad, but to seek to do better. Now, in addition to that, what else do we have to help us to be happy? The laws are in our conscience, so we have them within us. But in addition to that, God sent to us from time to time missionaries that come precisely to remind humanity about these laws. So we're not alone on this. So we have a model, we have a reference, we have the laws within us, we have missionaries who come and help us to reminding us about those laws. Now, has God provided all of us the means of knowing the law? Some people say, yeah, we have an unconscious, but how come we still make errors, right? So in question 619, the spirits are telling us, all may know it, but not all understand it. More persons which are the ones that are able to distinguish good from evil and to do good for all. And those who desire to examine it are the ones who understand it best. So, okay, so we have it, but we are gradually understanding the law. In order to do that, it's best if we desire. Now, on question 626, the spirits are going to say, since the divine laws are written in the book of nature, men and women are able to understand them as soon as they want to look into them. So what I highlighted here for you are the two verbs, to desire and to want. Why? It's time for us to become active in the process of applying, understanding, studying, comprehending these laws and letting these laws um, guide our relating and our living. So far, we have been evolving by the force of the law of progress, as if like there's like this force pushing us like really strongly out of our inactivity, out of our passivity, out of our inertia. So what we are invited to do at this point is to become proactive, active participants in the process. We're not going to get it right 100%, but it's important. It will make a difference on our happiness. If we make a conscious decision to study the law, if we have the desire to do better, if we are committed to improve our relationships, if we want, we truly want to put the effort to put the work necessary to improve our relating. Again, if you, on question 631, do humans have the means within them to distinguish good from evil? Yes, when they believe in God, and again, they desire to know God. It's, we need to desire to know the Father and the Father's laws, who has given us intelligence to discern one from the other. So God gave us the model. God gave us the laws. God gave us the intelligence to distinguish. God sent us missionaries. What else do we want a God to do, right? We got to do something ourselves. We have a work to do, a part that's ours, and we need to take charge of that. My last slide here um, is a summary of these ideas that Juan and Giangelis uh, bring to us in the introduction of the book existential conf conflicts when she says happiness is the happiness in the world is possible once the desire to obtain it has been developed and the spirit becomes proactive in disentangling it from the past and building new achievements no one was put on earth only to suffer but rather to create the conditions to real health and plentiful joy more, much of the suffering we experience has to do with our own passivity and the lack of priority given to a type of living that relates with what is truly essential in our lives. So she summarizes very well the idea that we have been uh, talking about. And finally, my dear friends, I am going to close in this last five minutes with uh, bringing you this uh, very briefly, the story of Jerónimo uh, Mendonça, who Brazilians know very well um, in the spiritualist movement, 
he was a healthy man uh, who uh, at some point, I think around 17, uh, he started to feel weakness on his legs and uh, was committed by rheumatoid arthritis that ended up paralyzing his body. And also he lost his sight. Um, this paralysis did not prevent him from um, traveling the entire country, opening, min I think, three different spiritual centers, talking everywhere and also helping um, thousands and thousands of people um, in the entire country. How did he do it? He traveled on the bed that you see him lying on. And one day a reporter from a TV asked him, uh, what happiness represented to him, what happiness would be. And his answer was that he would be happy if he could turn to the side, which he couldn't do. When I heard this story and I was putting this lecture together, what came to my mind is that perhaps we have been um, spiritually paralyzed in one position, looking straight ahead. We have been um, solely focused on our own path, our own ambitions, our own desires, our own truth, without turning to the side, truly turning to the side, to see the person next to us, to perhaps contemplate that he or she also may have a valid point, to contemplate that he or she might have needs that I have ignored, might have pains or sufferings that I have not been able to see, without looking to the side to develop one of the most powerful and necessary feelings in this world, which is the feeling of empathy and connection and to relate, to seek to relate, to understand about the importance of putting our time, our hearts and our resources, as I said, to develop true relationships, caring relationships. And this does not mean relationships with people only who think exactly like us, but particularly the ones who think differently. Our idea and our capacity to understand and to see them as brothers and sisters, children of God, the right that I have to think the way I think is the right that they have to think the way they think. And this does not make us enemies in any way, shape or form. We remain brothers and sisters. And part of what life is inviting us to do today is to look, is to turn, is to, overcome this paralysis that we have been uh, stuck in um, and to actually move, move to the side, move towards our neighbors, get off of this um, very personalistic uh, way of living and exercise our hearts, enlarge our hearts, make sure that in our hearts and lives, there's always and always a bigger and more spacious area to include everyone, to include more people, to have more friends, to expand our spiritual family and to invest all the resources that we have in our relationships, in the quality of our relationships and in loving each day more and more because outside of love, there is no salvation. Outside of loving our brothers and sisters, there is no salvation. They are the instrument. They are the path. They are our best tool for our own happiness. So with that, um, I will end my uh, lecture today, hoping that um, these uh, concepts can help us all in, in thinking, thinking about Again, going back to the beginning, you know, how is, um, how, how are our relationships today? How are we doing this area, right? And um, what is happiness about? What are we doing with our time, with our resources? Where are we putting our happiness, our expectations? All those things are important for us to think about. It's a great exercise. And so, again, I hope that this was helpful. I am going to end the meeting. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here with me, listening to my voice for a full hour. It's 12 o'clock sharp. So if you want, please join me in um, our final prayer for today. Dear Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we had to be here today together, connected 
mentally, emotionally, spiritually in this day. Help us all to be each moment more conscious and aware of the purpose of our lives and to set our priorities at the right place. Give us the strength to move on despite of all the difficulties and challenges that we face, understanding that everything, everything that life is giving us, it is definitely for the betterment of our own souls, of our own humanity. So for this day, for this opportunity, for each one of you who are listening, for all the spirits who are with us, who have given us the support and guided us throughout this hour, for God, for our Lord, we would like to say thank you so much. May the vibrations of this time be with all the ones who are in need, our loved ones, the ones who we don't know, people who are suffering, people who are in darkness, particularly the ones who are in despair, who are contemplating to end their lives. May the love of the Lord bring them hope and light, and may each one of us be nourished and renewed and continue on doing our best, our very best each day. Thank you so much, and so be it. All right. I wish you all a wonderful day, a wonderful Sunday, a wonderful week, and we'll be back next week with another lecture, continuing with our work. If you have any interest in finding out about our courses, we just wanted to remind everyone that Conscious Living remains open online. We have many courses, Portuguese, English, they're ongoing, reach out to us. We are also open for fraternal counseling. We have our Wednesday meeting where um, this one is in Portuguese. Uh, but if you wish fraternal counseling, we are also available. Just reach out to us through social media or through our phones. And uh, we are here to help as much as possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, JC, for the feedback. Flavio, nice to see you here. And bye, guys. Have a great Sunday.